Good morning, everybody that has joined us this, this very early morning um, on this very lively discussion, an important discussion that we're going to be having on stigma and mental health here in the District of Columbia. I'm Chiomo Ru. I am a parent of two children that go to Tacoma Education Campus here in the District of Columbia, and I'll be moderating the discussion. This discussion, I'm going to let the panelists, starting with Dr. Royster, introduce themselves and Dr. Scott, and then Renee, another mother. Good morning, everyone, and again, thank you for joining us. I'm Dr. Tanya Royster. I'm the director of the D.C. Department of Behavioral Health. I have the honor and privilege of serving the residents of the District of Columbia to ensure that their mental health and substance use disorder treatment, early intervention, and prevention needs are met. I'm also a child and adolescent psychiatrist by training with nearly 20 years experience working with children, families, and adults uh, with their mental health and substance use disorder needs. Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Sharnita Scott and I am a former Department of Behavioral Health School Mental Health Program clinician and former program manager. I worked with the School Mental Health Program from 2000 to 2015 and when I was a clinician I worked in the elementary, middle, and high schools with that, that population. Good morning, my name is Renee Davis. I'm the, the parent of two children with um, medically-based diagnoses of autism spectrum disorder. Um, I had, my children are of school age, and I'd like to be able to share the dramatically different experiences they have, have had since being diagnosed early and how mental health has affects them as a comorbid condition. Mm -hmm. Right. That's a perfect segue into my very first question, which is, you know, what are the common con uh, conditions that we experience? I'm also familiar with autism, but also ADHD, and I know a lot of families are dealing with anxiety and depression, but Dr. Royster, I know that you have much more of a, you know, extensive <laughs> clinical experience with what children are going through. So could you say more about that? Sure, sure. Well, children can present with a wide array of uh, diagnoses, but also even before the diagnosis stage, we call social emotional disorders, which means that they're having problems regulating their behavior because of their emotions. Um, and that kind of falls in two categories. Um, there's internalizing, which are the ones that are really the hardest to spot. Those are children that feel worried, feel sad, feel anxious. They may have thoughts of not wanting to live. They may have all kind of thoughts, but they hold them inside and they sit quietly in the back of the classroom. They may have trouble focusing on the work because they're so preoccupied with what they're thinking. And oftentimes, teachers and parents don't even know there's something wrong, okay. right? They don't even know because the kid is really holding it inside. And then we have those that teachers and parents are much more familiar with, which are the externalizing disorders. And those are uh, the ADHD, the behavior problems, sometimes mood disorders like bipolar disorder, or sometimes mm -hmm. even psychotic symptoms where you hear things or see things that tell you to behave in a certain way. That's the most severe, extreme example. But those are the things that come to adult attention because it bothers us, right? We don't want to see kids behaving in problematically or having problems sitting in class not right. being able to learn those are the things that I'm sure you've been called for oh yes um, oh, and yeah. so uh, you know I'm sure those are kind of things that the teachers talk to you about when they come and, and you have your parent teacher conferences yes. right? tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> and Dr. Scott I know that you've had quite a bit of experience in seeing the school-based mental health program you know, manifest, and how do you see clinical conditions manifest right now in the school systems? I think um, what often would be the case, because some of our most, well, a lot of our children are exposed to community violence and sometimes violence in their homes. Um, and so sometimes those um, experiences, in conjunction with their own makeup, mm -hmm. sometimes do combine to elevate to a clinical um, presentation or clinical diagnosis. And so we might see grief and loss initially, and then if it's not addressed, then it might rise to the level of a clinical diagnosis of depression or anxiety. Um, sometimes the, the uh, exposure to the violence in the neighborhoods mm -hmm. can give traumatic reactions. Mm -hmm. So you might see grief and loss and trauma. Mm -hmm. um, 
And then, of course, there are those situations that Dr. Royster talked about where there are inattentive and impulsive types of behaviors that might rise to the level of a diagnosis of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And from a mom's perspective, um, I know we're all moms, but you yeah. know, I want you to, see, uh, to mm -hmm. speak, you know, from your most recent experiences, like what do you see happening with your kids? Um, and even some, I know you're part of parent groups. What do you see happening? What are some of the conditions you see in the community? Well, one of the things about um, the autism, within the autism diagnosis that I think um, parents are, un un are may not be prepared for is the fact that the Autism is such a broad um, category, a broad range of experiences for their children that even within one household, you know, what, the way one kid, the way one of my children manifests their autism um, does include um, a, bouts, bouts of uh, depression and bouts of anxiety. And, and you know, it's, a lot of times it's hard to talk to their professionals that are working with them as to how to tell the difference between well, is he act is he or she acting out? Is it he or she acting out because of the autism? Is there are there any environmental triggers? Um, but one of the most um, one of the most interesting problems with that is how does the education system really work with the mental health professionals and how much is it, how much of, of this is, are we allowed to share with our teachers and, and community educational community members about our child? Um, without making it too private or without making it, without making, bringing up too much stigma. That's actually a couple of really interesting points that I want to highlight and reinforce because every mental illness is unique to every person, including mm -hmm. every child. Mm -hmm. There is no cookie cutter, if you're depressed, you'll be exactly like this, right? right? Or if you're anxious, you'll be exactly like this. We talk about the disorders in a way that kind of gives the most general common sets of symptoms but you can really present in the way that's unique to you, your environment, your genetic makeup. And so even in a family where everybody has something like generalized anxiety disorder, mm -hmm. everybody could experience it differently, everybody could present differently, and everybody may respond to different treatments. That's one of the things that I think makes mental illness so difficult to talk about, mm -hmm. so difficult to engage people in, because everybody's experience can be different. But certainly there's enough commonalities where we can all have the conversation. And if I can add to that, I always wanted um, parents to know what their child's baseline behavior was, mm -hmm. so that you, if you have a sense of that, then mm -hmm. it kind of helps you evaluate when there's a little difference, mm -hmm. right? And then you can mm -hmm. have the conversation with your child or your teen mm -hmm. to explore what that difference might be about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And even for, um, a child and a teenager who becomes more self-aware about their depression, they might have, if you will, a low-grade depression as their baseline, mm -hmm. right? right? But then you have to know if all of a sudden I'm finding that bed feels so good, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then it's, it could be an indicator mm -hmm. something shifting mm -hmm. in my in my typical, mm -hmm. you know, presentation. Yeah. So curious about the, you know, there's a lot of talk of the two generational approach mm -hmm. now. So with the conditions and the experience with the conditions, do you see, you know, if you're confronted with a parent that's struggling with the mental health condition, and then the child is now struggling, how do you how do you interact? How do you, uh, what is your treatment plan for that kind of situation, or just based on? general understanding of the conditions and so I don't know the clinical terms here so <laughs> help me catch up. <laughs> no, I think actually that's a, a, a great um, a great point because a lot of times parents have been suffering yeah. for a very long time. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things I found as a child psychiatrist is that parents will bring their child in before they will get help for themselves. Mm. Yeah. But in working with that child, that could be an entree for treatment for the parent as well. Mm. Um, because you can then talk about what some of these symptoms may look like, what yeah. some of these presentations, and what help is available. And oftentimes, parents will do things for their kids that they're not able to do for themselves. Right. And right. so that can be an entree um, to support a whole family, really. Yeah. Yeah. And I know that one of the things that I would um, always help parents to know and recognize children are watching you, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. And so when mm -hmm. they see mommy or daddy having um, a difficult time and acting differently mm -hmm. or, um, or the teens even when mm -hmm. they're worried about their parents, um, 
it's important for the parents to show that they are going to take care of themselves yeah. because yeah. The, the, the child, the teen, they're going to take it on. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, um, and then sometimes there's a learning opportunity right there yeah. for them to see how you handle yeah. when you need to reach out and get help, that yeah. it's okay to, to get help yeah. you know, and to ask for it. Um, for, for me, for me, that really brings up uh, what I really experience a lot of is um, not having a complete health history, even for myself mm -hmm. or even for my children's father or for their family. And um, um, the other issue for me is like, how do I, how do I as a parent, well, do, who do I put the oxygen mask on first, yeah, me yeah. or the child, yeah. or or we, mm -hmm. the family? Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of there's a lot to do with. Um, be having bar having real concrete barriers to access in healthcare systems yeah. right now. I mean, the first thing that I think about is the financial part, mm -hmm. and the second thing I think about is the uh, fi the healthcare, the financial part, the time away from from work, mm -hmm. the time away from um, school for the kids to to access Absolutely. care. You know, um, I, I would be I would really be re um, neglectful if I didn't talk about how hard it is to, to access those kind of systems yeah. when you have blended in non-traditional and other, otherwise non-identified families. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, absolutely, and that's exactly why I'm so excited about the school-based mental health program expanding okay. just for those financial reasons, as you yeah. just mentioned. Mm -hmm. And um, I just want to note for those that are listening in, we're going to get to your questions at the end, so please ask them as we're you know, continuing on. And just transitioning into our next question here, which is around stigma, right? So um, I, I'm going to start with, with you, Renee, yeah. in, in terms of you kind of touched on it um, a little bit around there are barriers, right? There are financial yes. barriers, there's access to mm -hmm. care, but then there's the For, for me, it's cultural. Stigma. It's, it's, mm -hmm. There's a lot of stigma and cultural barrier. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I know people talk a lot about Me Too movements and um, the politics of, like, come into voice mm -hmm. but voice is something that's really difficult mm -hmm. when you when you are a family that's struggling with the diseases and with the, the disorder so I think the, the thing that's helped me a lot is that I've started to work with them like a support group kind of community I, I found I, I kind of joke and say well my my Facebook friends and my other families with autism and other families with other cold disorders they're like more family than my own family sometimes mm -hmm. because you know, being able to talk to other parents, being able to talk to other parents you meet in the waiting room, other people you meet in the field, has really been the support mechanism that's really tangible for me. Mm -hmm. sure. um, but the stigma is really real because um, you, you don't know what to share with within which community. Is it, um, so, my, so in the case of my nine-year-old, my nine-year-old looks very, very typical. When you see this little guy, you think, oh, he's just a regular black kid, black American kid, African American kid. But then when you start to get to know him and understand that autism does affect him differently, and then when there's changes in his school day, there's changes in, his, changes in the um, environment at school or at home, he can act, at, act out in ways that are not typical. Right. Um, so I, that's my current struggle is that with him, it's been harder because he still has all the traditional expectations of, be an African American kid, right. but added to that is well, he's also in these other categories too. Mm -hmm. Sure, and Dr. Royster, I know you mean working directly with children. Mm -hmm. How do you see stigma impacting their openness to care, or you know, their reception of the need for treatment? Well, I mean, I think stigma. I mean, as you ladies know, it goes way back. Yeah, right. It goes way back. Um, at the beginning of the dawn of mental health or psychiatry or mm -hmm. our understanding of mental illness, we used to think, oh, we got to put these people away, okay. right? Mm -hmm. Let's hide them away. Communities and cultures mm -hmm. for years have decided that the best way to deal with someone who's not conforming yeah. is to put them away. Right. And thankfully, in the last century, we've come a long way in that, but the attitudes and beliefs haven't changed. So even though we let them out of the institutions, we kept them locked in our minds, still in institutions, and still mm -hmm. unable to function in society. And so we treat them differently, or we don't talk about them and pretend like it's not happening. Mm -hmm. um, and that's mm -hmm. hurtful yeah. 
yeah. right? It's hurtful mm -hmm. to the people with mental illness. It's hurtful to the families that are trying to get them help. And so stigma hurts. It, it, it hurts in a very, very real way. It keeps people out of care, keep people from talking about things that are very, very real in their lives, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Like we're having this discussion that helps uh, eliminate mm -hmm. the stigma. I think another thing that helps eliminate the stigma is to really put a personal face on mental illness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not some person who's crazy and mm -hmm. can't function. You know, behavior occurs on a continuum. Exactly. And so just because someone's having a bad day, that doesn't make them crazy or have a mental illness. But mm -hmm. a person who does have a mental illness can also hold a job, be married, have mm -hmm. children, yep. um, do well in school, be the valedictorian, do whatever they want to do. Exactly. Um, with the right services and supports, mm -hmm. um, mental illness is very treatable. It's a medical condition. Um, that is often triggered by environmental factors, but it's very, very treatable. And the, 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 the shame and the guilt, and also, I mean, in some cultures, there's a, a spiritual component, yes. right? If yes. We think somebody must have done something wrong in yeah, our yeah. ancestry, and it's mm -hmm. acting out in the child in this way, yes. right? Yes. So there are all kind of cultural reasons that keep the shame and the guilt and the stigma alive today, as much as we try to dispel it with conversations like this. And if I can just add, in the schools, what I think has helped to reduce stigma is when you're um, providing services at the prevention level, mm -hmm. the early okay. intervention, and the treatment level. Early intervention, So at, yes. the, at the prevention mm -hmm. level, when you're going into the classrooms mm -hmm. and you are providing um, curriculum for the whole classroom and you're developing relationships okay. and they're getting used to the clinician there mm -hmm. in the school, um, then there is there's an opportunity to have conversations, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. that, that starts setting yeah. that stage yeah. for conversations. Mm -hmm. And then when your treatment um, interventions are a little fun mm -hmm. and maybe yeah. using creative arts mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and they're going back with their art projects mm -hmm. if they choose yeah. to take them from the treatment room, then we went mm -hmm. from, I remember as a clinician, a child saying, I'm not crazy, to, um, I got issues. Can I come? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah. So, so there exactly. were yeah. the, the children become ambassadors yeah. for mm -hmm. getting help. Yeah. You know, and sometimes we'll even refer a peer. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, yeah. and so. Yeah, I mean, I, from a from a parent perspective, I would say for me, you know, I'm always curious how it plays out in the classroom because I'm not there mm -hmm. every oh, day, yeah, yeah. right? How maybe mm -hmm. a child who's not um, dealing with a clinical condition. Um, interacting with a child that's known to have a clinical condition. Um, you know, can you say more, Dr. Scott, about, I know you, you're, you do the yeah. play works and things like that, but just in how the stigma manifests, mm -hmm. like what are some of the things you hear the children say or what are some of the language? I know we, we talked about language, the language yeah. they use that may be negative that may impact like some people may not even know that they're negative, like crazy or mm -hmm. retarded right. or yeah. right. What's some of the language that you see? So you still have yeah. you still have some of that that happens. Yeah. And and you know, children sometimes are dealing with their own um, difficulties and they know which children are more vulnerable mm -hmm. that they yeah. can trigger. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. And so sometimes they will do that to get a charge and to get either a deflection. Um, and so that's why school climate and school culture mm -hmm. initiatives in that school are mm -hmm. so important, mm -hmm. so that there is a tolerance for differences and vulnerabilities. Yeah. Yeah. And um, you know that there is an embracing mm -hmm. of, for instance, we've had, I remember we had a child who was selectively mute mm -hmm. and the children, mm -hmm would speak for the child. Mm -hmm. wow. And so then the teacher had to say, we want to hear that child's voice. Mm -hmm. But they naturally mm -hmm. want to support. Yeah. Yeah. So just yeah. on the same end that you right. might have children mm -hmm. who will trigger and instigate, yeah. um, and then you have to address that, yes. mm -hmm. you'll also have children who just, out of the human kindness, mm -hmm. yes. will um, intervene and help. I think that's so yeah. important yeah. because yeah. children have to be taught stigma. 
right? Yes, Children exactly. naturally yeah, exactly. are unbiased and, and they tolerate and they, they mm -hmm. want to support. They're the way that we all They're were learning. at some point, They're right? So day, they yeah. watch us yeah. and they see how we deal with things or yeah. they listen to us and yeah. they mm -hmm. hear how we talk about things yeah. and then that's what they reflect back to other children. That's part of the reason our early interventions in preschools uh, and things are so yes. important yes. to normalize yeah. talking about feelings, to normalize having mm -hmm. to manage right. your emotions right. so that yeah. it doesn't develop into stigma uh, yeah. later on. And then that helps families as well. But children are resilient and they're supportive and they're encouraging mm -hmm. unless they're taught something else. Yes. And, and within the parent community, right? Right, right. You know, um, watching our own language. I mean, yeah, it's, it's yeah. One, of the, one of the most in-depthful things that being part of a support group has shown me is that how important it is to model the behavior and how to actually get professional training for myself as a parent. Yeah. I, I think um, there's, but, you know, reaching out to say, well, I need, I'm going to need help in coaching myself on how to, how to present this to my family mm -hmm. yeah. or how to present this to my child's school environment. So I've extensively utilized um, people that are called educational consultants, and I've talked to people, I've made a thing, a, re a great relationship with my child's pediatrician. Mm -hmm. You know, so some of the language is not language that's going to be naturally within my my community, mm -hmm. so I have to go out and look for people who can model the behavior for me, or who can sh teach me, or help even represent me in those spaces where I have to describe what my child's going to need or what my child doesn't need. So, uh, in, in terms of my l younger kid, the, the nine year old is in an inclusion setting, but we bring supports to him. You know, we have to go through a, a process to get one to one help in the classroom for him, but the one to one helper in that classroom is really helping all the kids out in that classroom. That's yeah. the thing that's really missing from that the debate about, well, why are so many special education dollars going to this kid or that kid? Well, th those dollars are going to impact the whole culture of the whole that's classroom. Right. Um, that kind of environment was not available to my nine-year-old because by law, you don't, you're not guaranteed inclusion in the classroom. You, you have to go through a process to fight for inclusion in right. the classroom. Yeah. You know, so for, for my daughter who's in a, um, a school that's, the, that's in a least restrictive environment, it becomes, the di discussion becomes about well, which kids are labeled as ED mm -hmm. and which kids are labeled with the autism. And, and ED yeah. is emotional, emotional disturbance. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. and how, do, how can we have, inclusion for her is doing school activities with kids across the whole campus mm -hmm. yeah. with both the autism and learning disability and EDD. So that's a form of inclusion for her yeah. in yeah. and of itself that um, even within the disability community, we, we, are in, we have to be more inclusive among ourselves. A very and I wanted to, yeah. to join there because when you were talking, I was thinking in terms of that whole sense of getting a school trauma informed mm -hmm. yes. speaks to that same. Uh, um, I just, I'm just just discovering yeah. that language. Like, <laughs> I, I, and I'll tell you why. I had, I had to discover that language when that phone call happened. Yeah. Miss Davis, come get your child. Yeah. Yes. Like, so I said, yes. well, yeah. which child? Which child <laughs> am I <coming? laughs> but, but speaking to what yes. you're saying, that yeah. you want the environment yeah. to yes. be responsive and sensitive yes. to the child who has experienced trauma. And when you mm -hmm. are that way in your environment, yeah. everyone benefits from that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and also when you were talking about, when I was hearing the word coaching in my mind when you were talking mm -hmm. about yeah. it, it's the same thing that we are trying to make available for teachers mm -hmm. and for administrators, yeah. you know, so that yeah. um, we can build their capacity to be responsive and sensitive to children. Mm -hmm. And then to, because education and being that leader, educator, administrator, it's stressful, so to meet their needs too, mm -hmm. yeah. so that their uh -huh. um, tank gets filled, yeah. so that they can provide. When we provide. reduce yeah. stigma, we're helping everybody, That's right? Helping. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. I said, yeah. stigma hurts. It keeps mm -hmm. people from having conversations, from addressing what's actually going on. Mm -hmm. It keeps people from getting the help that they need for asking for help because they don't want to be identified as different yeah. or, or somehow in special need. And, yeah. and we all have needs, and so yes. what makes somebody's needs more special than others? Right. We all got needs. It's right. right. be okay right. to say I have a need. It's okay yes. to have a need. <laughs> so we're kind of getting to this next question here around how do we stop mm -hmm. stigma? How do we take the weight out of... Mm -hmm. you know, any conditions, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. specifically things like 
depression or anxiety or autism or ADHD or I mean yeah. we can get to the psychosis I mean mm -hmm. these things carry weight mm -hmm. and we know the impact that they have in the real world and they have in people's imaginations and Dr. Scott you started talking about strategies that you're using in terms of training with the teachers and administrators and hopefully parents need training too because, yes yeah. you no know, it's everyone it's, it's everyone. everyone it's can everyone. you say more about some of the strategies that we can low-level strategies and maybe be deeper systemic things that can happen that you see that need to happen to stop stigma? Pretty basic what comes to my mind is just to open the stage and the opportunities for conversations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, just to empower teachers how to notice when there are changes mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. that baseline because they know their they know their children, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh -huh. And then to just check in and um, and make it so that you're you, it's clear you're available and you're interested and you're curious mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right yeah. um, and then sometimes there are you know pairings where children will go ahead and disclose that mm -hmm. my parents got divorced mm -hmm. right they'll yeah. share it with each other mm -hmm. or um, that there was uh, a shooting in my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And so just to have those conversations, mm -hmm. I think when you have that and then you're interjecting normal stress reactions, normal reactions to grief, normal da 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 da, then you're starting to shift that it's not bad. You don't right. have to be ashamed. Right. Um, they're so worried about what other people will think about me if I have a problem. Right. You start tempering down on those instances. Yeah. I think yeah. we got to give a shout out to our current public awareness campaign. Yes. Yeah, you know, yes. Everybody <laughs> go to healthymindsdc.com where yeah. you'll yeah. see yeah. children and mm -hmm. families talking about mm -hmm. mental illness. And yeah. that's one yeah. of the ways that we reduce the stigma. I yeah. mean, mm -hmm. Dr. Aru is one of the featured parents on, <laughs> on that site talking about her struggles yeah. with coming to acceptance and yeah. getting help for her kids and then becoming an advocate. It's a journey mm -hmm. like everything else in life. And yeah. so reducing stigma is a journey. Um, and one mm -hmm. of the ways that we're doing that is by giving parents the information they need to manage it themselves, their own feelings. Mm -hmm. Then you got to help your family, right? Because right. your family's probably saying some things, yeah. like like you yeah. said, Renee. It's in the community, um, yeah. And then yeah. you know, working with kids and working with teachers, and so there are so many different audiences, but yeah. everyone yeah. is important. I mean, we have to address them all. So we yeah. partner with any and everybody who will uh, listen and is willing to have us there. So we're at, you know, all summer. This is really our high time to to do stigma campaigns. We're yeah. out at the the affairs in the park, the outreach communities that the police do, mm -hmm. every kind of event in this District of Columbia will be there, um, encouraging people to talk about mental illness, making fun games, um, giving giveaways with the little uh, website on it so that people yeah. have, when they get home and they're like, oh, what is this ball? Oh, it's got a website on it. Yeah. <laughs> they, they love the yeah. stress yeah. balls, they right? Because you get to talk yeah. about stress it, right? and, and then they and want the ball. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, and I, I do want to say that um, to DCPS's credit, what uh, in the re-enrollment forms this year, they uh -huh. have um, the, the they have a form now that says social emotional indicators yes. and asking, you know, confidential questions and asking mm -hmm. if you want intervention or not, mm -hmm. um, yeah. disclosing if there's a divorce, a separation, death mm -hmm. in the family, or other conditions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's one way that I've seen, you know, that safe spaces to start to address mm -hmm. real issues. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, Renee, I don't know what happens well, in your children's school. I know mm -hmm. you kids go to charters. So yeah. can you say about how you feel supported and how maybe destigmatization may be happening? Oh, yeah. I think I think the entire process, um, one of the, I'm, I'm a big, I was, I became educated about autism through the early intervention process as part of the education system. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, so having the, having the legislative dollars devoted to early intervention, mm -hmm. having the legislative dollars devoted to having um, in-school intervention specialists, the, the, that's made the difference in having my children be er, identified early mm -hmm. enough to make an impact from their from the medical perspective and then now now as they go into early adolescence and teen teens my children are in two different communities but 
they still are benefiting from the fact that they had the early intervention for going forward. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that I think a lot about is the um, having the, the legislative process include um, funding the, the funding these acts that put dollars into the school. Yeah. You know, there's always going to be a debate about whether the money should follow the individual child or should the money go to a charter or a public. But when cases of mental health and disability combined, those dollars just need to be earmarked in there. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and that, and then, they'll, then we'll see changes with how the, the, the lowering the stress level of the teachers and the administrators and things. But we want to make sure those, those items are fully funded. Yeah, and, if, and as parents, we have to be the parental and the legislative, make the, make the impact with the we legislators. Make the work. <laughs> yeah, that's right, by voting yeah. the folks in that are going to do that. Yeah. So, yeah. so, Dr. Issa, can you say more just a little bit about opportunities that um, the healthymindsdc.com, it's open to the entire community, Absolutely, right? Absolutely, yeah. So, um, opportunities for anyone can get on the, on the site, can use it, whether you have a kid enrolled in school or not, right? Yeah. And that's available right now, right? We can all go to healthymindsdc.com today and get help in terms of understanding different conditions, right? Yeah, and mm -hmm. you can also sign up to get email updates or alerts or different things, whatever we're going to send out. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. Soon coming. That's Soon right. right. Yeah. Uh, well, well, well. Mm -hmm. And you can ask questions. So yeah. we, we actually had a question from a 12-year-old who said, I have suicidal thoughts. What should I do? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Young yeah. people use different avenues to get help than we used to. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And so this young person saw the website, liked the graphics, liked the personal stories, and typed in a question. And because we monitor it, we yeah. were able to connect her to care, encourage her to talk to her family. But at that yeah. age, you know, you can say, hey, at least get mm -hmm. started with the conversation. Mm -hmm. Most jurisdictions around the country have some provision where a young person 12 to 13 or 14 can start to get care, particularly yeah. in an uh, urgent oh, situation, yeah. okay. and start to talk to someone mm -hmm. um, in that clinician and then works with the young person to, to get their family involved. Yeah. Um, but we don't want to turn young people away who are seeking help if they have stigma in their homes and they're scared to talk to their parents about it. All right. Right. So, um, you know, we prior to, you know, going live, you know, we're talking about the new Washington Post article mm -hmm. that says that, um, you know, black kids between ages of five to 12 years old are on the rise for suicide. And we know that suicide is a consequence of mm -hmm. anxiety and depression untreated. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, Dr. Scott, you had a lot to say about, you know, the village being around mm -hmm. and, and addressing these issues. Can you can you talk more about what your thoughts are on, you know, the, I was surprised. Five year, I have a five-year-old. Yeah. So, yes. I mean, to imagine a five-year-old, yes. you know, and sometimes we don't want to address it at that young age, you know. Can you talk more about your thoughts on what's happening right well, now? Well, it, um, it, one that I was aware because personally I, I know of um, instances of a uh, good friend who's had to take child to um, the emergency room today. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's up for me personally. Mm -hmm. um, but I also remembered when I was a clinician that when the elementary young child was saying that they wanted to kill themselves, sometimes the response of the adults was, because they couldn't manage it, yeah. the yes. first statement was, what would they have to be sad about? Why would they want to be yeah. killing themselves? I mean, they're just little. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so it is so important to recognize that these are human beings mm -hmm. yeah. who have feelings and, um, and they have limited life experiences. So what they are experiencing in yeah. that moment in time mm -hmm. is through the roof because they don't have the reference of working it through, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. So that's yeah. why the communication yeah. and the curiosity and the check-ins yeah. are so important yeah. because we know from our life experiences that that sadness you can get over the hump, mm -hmm. but the children don't know that. And when they don't have the coping skills, yeah. and mm -hmm. when they're hearing about other children mm -hmm. who have chosen that permanent uh, choice mm -hmm. to a temporary situation, mm -hmm. um, then they might try. Yeah. So it, it is saddening to me that we have it on the rise, but it's it's something that they're telling us right. that we yeah. need to respond to. Right. Yeah, right? I think the kids yeah. have so much more to deal with today like yes. perhaps like we don't know why yet why this is happening um, particularly in this age group and yeah. in this 
population that hasn't typically had the highest suicide rate among mm -hmm. very young children. Yeah. Um, but what we do know is all children today are exposed to more in their communities, yes. more on television, mm -hmm. more in video games, that they don't understand. more in the yeah. books the book, that they uh, read, mm -hmm. more, 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 that they're more. not ready to take in, to understand, and to process. And so if you see you know, cartoons and video games where people are knocking each other over the head or shooting each other, yeah. and then they just, you know, you hit restart and they come back, mm -hmm. right? That, that doesn't compute mm. to a five, even 10 year old, even 12 year old, the permanency yeah, of that's death. A, that's so, a point. so just that's dealing point. with a situation that's temporary, it may seem, oh, I'm just gonna kill myself, yeah. right? Yeah. But they haven't translated, like you said, there are so many other options but also, they've learned these options through a whole slew of environmental factors that just children didn't have in the past. And I think I also think that there's a lot of things that are hidden by the the availability of um, the availability of media in mm -hmm. the home and in your personal life. Uh, although there's very you know it might be difficult to say to a, your two and three year old. Let's put down the phone. Let's mm -hmm. let's do FaceTime. Let's let's not do as much time on the screen. Mm -hmm, I mean, mm -hmm. I found that 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 as parents, we are we ourselves are so bombarded with that kind of information that yeah. we have to be able to put ourselves on a diet of reducing the amount of technology, diet, yeah. to reducing yeah. the amount of media that we expose ourselves to. Yeah. But um, but that but I also want to say that the um. When, in terms of the differences between what's happening with the, our little old kids, the five to 12, because mm -hmm. I, I have both, a five, uh, one that's on the, the younger end and one that's already considered a teenager, the responsiveness of the medical community and the responsiveness of the um, educational community is quite different. So I would like to see that we do more to educate the younger teachers and the younger mm -hmm. practitioners that it really it is a real, it can be a very real expect expression for a younger child Absolutely. Yeah. Um, because I've seen the difference in how my between my, what my teenager is able to get in terms of access of uh, supports mm. and the difference between what my little guy can see in elementary school and I think that our teachers and our support staff our bus drivers our mm -hmm. bus attendants mm -hmm. the whole right. system of people that our children interact with need to have a, a special um, training mm -hmm. on child earlier diagnosis of childhood trauma, distress, and in, in, within my community, um, disability. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. I think a lot of those numbers mask how, how underdiagnosed learning and educational disabilities can be. Yeah. yeah, and I think that, you know, we also as a system have to respond better mm -hmm. because e I do believe that everybody's goal is to keep the child safe, right, and to right. keep the child mm -hmm. alive. But oftentimes, I'm sure as parents, you'll, you'll yeah. agree that this is true. A child says something is wrong, and the school says, go get an assessment, don't bring them back. Until, until yeah. you're oh, right. Yeah. 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 right? So, <laughs> so, so, so don't bring Pandora's them back until box. it's fixed, right? Yeah. And so then yeah. the kid yeah. and the parent learn yeah. that we shouldn't bring our problems to the it's educational educational. environment. Yeah, right. Because right. they're going to yeah. exclude us. Yeah. And yeah. that's not what they mean to do. No. That's yeah. not what we mean to do. But yes. what we're trying to do is make sure that everybody's safe. So how, again, the school-based program is one way to make sure they can get yeah. that support and uh -huh. stay in school. Right. Um, but we have to make sure that our response is if we encourage all of these adults to you know, take seriously what kids say, but we have to take seriously and act on it in the natural environment. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. can I also, I, was, I had a couple of thoughts when you were talking, Dr. Royster. One is um, that the school nurses and the teachers oftentimes are the ones that do hear mm -hmm. the concerns mm -hmm. of the children firsthand. Yes. Yeah. And it can be very overwhelming to them. Uh -huh. yes. um, and so I know that school nurses have asked for more workshops mm -hmm. and training yeah. so that they mm -hmm. are available mm -hmm. to the children in the way that they need to be mm -hmm. um, and, and to be responsive and to be able to refer. Yeah. And there is a behavioral health online training mm -hmm. that oh, okay. DBH offers wow. um, that school staff, school oh, principals oh. can uh -huh. um, can access that will allow you to know the signs and symptoms mm -hmm. of at-risk children, right? Mm -hmm. How to have those difficult conversations with the children to kind of explore, because yes. it is kind of uncomfortable and you need the language and the words, so it gives you an opportunity to do that, mm -hmm. um, but also to have the conversations with the parents and then how to refer. Yes. So 
Um, because once, yeah, once there's an yeah, incident, we'll, we'll see that on the Healthy Minds DC that yeah. that com website as well. Hopefully, as there's well. a resource up. And, yeah, and I just want to pause for one second because yeah. I think that we're going to transition into taking questions from people, and we can tie in some mm -hmm. of our responses to to those questions. Okay, well, while we're getting the first question, let me say one more thing that it's really important to remember that it's bi-directional because as we teach yeah. the parents, I mean the teachers and the bus attendants about how mm -hmm. to um, yeah. identify things and then engage families, you know, we've reduced mm -hmm. stigma, but then the parents have to be receptive. Right? Yeah. Yeah. You're just trying to pick on my kid. Yeah. You right. don't want my kid in your classroom. Like, yeah. no, the, the teachers are giving you this information because mm -hmm. they really want to help your child succeed. Yeah. And so we oh, don't yeah. want you to mm -hmm. minimize it. And we don't want you to tell your kid, don't tell your teacher that again, right? Yeah. Because right. then the yeah. kid also learns, I can't talk can't about, it right? It so it's bi-directional. Parents and teachers have to be receptive and open to dealing with this, whichever environment it comes to first. Sure. So uh, the first question is, what is the best way to, to communicate a child's need to their teacher's school in a way that creates a partnership of oh, care? Wow. So, wow. Yeah, that was that. <laughs> Yeah. Wow. Well, that was kind of, kind of, sort of that was wow. answered. Um, you know, I have a few thoughts yeah. on that, yeah, but I, yeah, yeah. you know, Renee, yeah. do, I, I want to, I want to be really blunt about that one. I think it's important to show up as a parent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, the it is too easy to tell the kid, here's your backpack, here's your juice, your orange juice, whatever, <laughs> go. I think it's important for us as parents to show up to the school to really to not let the enrollment process and the um, the process of being enrolled in the school, the process of picking a school if you're going to go to charter school method, I think it's important to show and be the, present um, at the events that the school asks you to be at. Mm -hmm. I mean, so my motto is we're not sick and we're not shut in. Mm -hmm. You know, we are mm -hmm. who we are as a family. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and the, the, the conversations about diversity of experience have, can happen face to face mm -hmm. while you're at the, in the school environment. I mean, so I think the first step as a parent is just to show up, yeah. answer yeah. the answer the email, go to the go to the PTA or the FSA, and really use the enrollment process at the beginning of every school year as a chance to talk face to face with all the folks that are going to be interacting with your child that day. And it could be something simple. It could be, oh well, this summer my kids did this, you know. Let me let you know that my uh, my uh, my children's grandparents are doing this this summer, or they did that this week. You know, I think it's, it's relationship. It's relationship. Yeah, it's build relationship. relationship. As a parent, we've been building the relationship with the school community first. Yeah. yeah. Dr. Scott, did you want to add to yeah. that? Well, I mean, I would. One thing that comes to my mind is that I have to become an advocate for my kids, mm -hmm. right? So, but that takes a lot of study and knowledge and, and understanding of what advocacy actually means and and to build relationships that aren't always combative i want to just make a plug for advocates for justice and education yeah. on june first mm -hmm. is a parent to parent training that kind of gives some of these strategies of how mm -hmm. um one we are the best referral source and yeah. district of columbia is rare in mm -hmm. states across the united states that actually honors that a parent is a source of a referral for ah, right. evaluation okay. so we can go directly to our our teachers or administrator or mm -hmm. if your kid is in pre-k you can go to early stages and you can say i want my child evaluated for x mm -hmm. y and z condition mm -hmm. and then comes the great partnership that's happening with the school-based um project a mental health project is is getting the medical sector, it's getting the yeah. clinical side to understand the need for those bridges between what's happening in the hospitals or mm -hmm. in the in the clinic clinicians, you know, um, however you access your clinician through the hospital or through a, through their practice, um, to actually have those diagnoses that are happening outside of the school yeah. be brought into the school mm -hmm. to inform treatment mm -hmm. and care and education plans mm -hmm. so that we should part of the stigmatization is that free sharing that if my child just got diagnosed mm -hmm. um, outside and I know he just got diagnosed with ADHD you know it's my duty to bring that information yeah. into his IEP meeting or if it's a kid without an IEP into the parent-teacher environment and develop strategies schools have 
um, support teams. And they now have, you know, increasingly behavioral specialists mm -hmm. that can help translate your clinical diagnosis into the educational environment. So, you know, I want parents to feel comfortable to bring in that information and honestly getting the schools to help pay in cases that you can't pay for it because that's part of the school's duty as well to yeah. provide that um, access to an evaluation diagnosis. So, And there's mm -hmm. in D.C. what you're speaking to, I think, just operationalizes this whole whole school, whole, whole child, child, whole yeah. community, yeah. Right. right? Yeah. Yes. Whole That's school, whole, whole child, child, whole, whole community. community. Yeah. Yep. And mm -hmm. I, I think I just want to echo both what Chioma and Renee said. As a parent, yeah. the times when I've needed the school to help with my children, I had to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. I had to say yeah. my child is really shy. Yeah. And mm -hmm. my child is going to struggle with this. And if the teacher doesn't know that the child the teacher can't make the environment such that the child can mm -hmm. be successful. Yeah. Right? And it, mm -hmm. it it might seem like a little thing, but if you don't speak out in class and if you're afraid to ask questions, mm -hmm. you're going to miss some learning. Yeah. And the teacher's yeah. not going to know that. Yeah. She's just mm -hmm. going to think, wow, that kid's really quiet. This is a great kid, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right, and there's right. something deeper but happening. But you have yeah. to be honest. or You mm -hmm. know, you have to be honest about what mm -hmm. your child's struggles are. And I agree with you, Renee, the earlier you do that in the school year, the more successful your yeah. teacher can be. Yeah. yeah. And, and it, it's also within, like, because some of these issues are medical, mm -hmm. they are, quite frankly, biochemical mm -hmm. and medical, the other, the other thing that's our responsibility as parent is to look out, look for our, look at our medical professionals too. Mm -hmm. The free, if it's a free clinic, if it's a drop-in clinic, you know, utilizing that time in the year when you have to get your enrollment paperwork and your shots and immunizations to really talk to your your child's primary, establishing a medical home for your child or a relationship with, with a ch children's pediatric specialist. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I, if my pediatrician hadn't told me. Wow, your child isn't speaking. You know, is that a concern? You know, it's. <laughs> you were like, I mean, oh yeah, it is. It is right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, um, I had to, I in a case of um in the case of this of autism, it was really it was really critical to have a medical diagnosis mm -hmm. early because it, it turned over lever by acknowledging the the, the medical side mm -hmm. of what's happening with my kids. I was able to open the door on the, on the educational side mm -hmm. and and then get them to work together, mm -hmm. yeah. but. But if, if your child is not quite school age and is approaching school age, definitely looking out for being present as a parent to take them to their medical practitioners. Sure. I was I wanna, just, uh, let, can I, can sure, I get sure, to the sure. next question yeah, yeah. and tie yeah, it in? Yeah. But the next question is, do you recommend that children that are being seen by therapists have a behavioral plan created that includes management in the school setting? I, I have to raise my hand. <laughs> I, that is, that I, is I have yeah, yeah. I, um, I think it. I think it's critical to have behavior-based plans because there are emergencies. Mm -hmm. There really are emergencies. In um, having an open discussion about behavior-based management, it really gives you as a parent a chance to make choices. That in the heat of an emergency, you may not be. You may not have been the first person they called. Mm -hmm. In the heat of an emergency with your child, the first person they called could have been the principal, or it could have been the guidance counselor. But if you want to have a specific chain of people to be contacted in an emergency, and that and that's happened to me, happened to me as a parent, not just in the school setting, but uh, my kid was in a um, tennis class, and unfortunately, the tennis classes, the tennis court was on federal property because mm. it's we're in Washington D.C. We have different parks and things, so that first phone call and ended up being the police, the federal police, because <laughs> the kid mm. was playing tennis on a court, mm -hmm. and the meltdown happened on federal property. So again, I, I think it's really clear that you have to have a chance to develop behavior plans and, be, and behavior-based management strategies up front and in writing, if you yeah. can do it. And, and I, I, I just want to kind of clarify what a behavior plan is, because I think for, for most of us, we live our life, families, teachers, with an informal behavior plan, right? Yes. Okay. You do this, this is the consequence. Right. You do this, this is the way that things are gonna go. That's the way most people run their families, that's the way most teachers run their classroom. Right. So should there be a formal clinical you know, behavior plan based on a diagnosis? It depends on the diagnosis, Yeah. right? Um, but I think that most teachers and, and most parents are informally doing that kind of behavior management all the time. Yeah. It's kind of naturally what we do with children to help socialize them and help 
help raise them. Yeah. So I think the fact that we can then talk about how does it get to a formalized setting in, in the right circumstances with the right children mm -hmm. um, is critical. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to add, even as young as the elementary um, age, involve a child in that plan. Mm -hmm. Because oh, yes. we were um, in the schools often helping children to develop their helping team mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so they could identify okay. who would be on their helping team. Mm -hmm. And then I know as a clinician, um, it talks about that whole confidentiality piece, I would um, ask the child if they wanted to let the, let the teacher or whoever it was know that they were on the helping team, right? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And so we would walk around together mm -hmm. to do okay. that. Um, wow. The other piece is whatever um, intervention, if it's taking a five minute time out with Miss so-and-so, right? Okay. That the child yeah. is saying that worked for them so that they're involved is the only thing, not just the adults making the decisions, you know? Great, so I, I also wanna add that if your child has an IEP or a 504, it is mandated that you have a behavioral intervention yes, yeah. plan. Mm -hmm. So schools have to do that, and it'd be great if your medical doctor does that. But we're, we're wrapping up, and so Dr. Royster, just any, any closing thoughts here? I'm so grateful for you ladies uh, to have this amazing conversation to help uh, families and communities, not just in the District of Columbia, because we're on Facebook Live, right? <laughs> we, are, we are talking to uh, people all over the country um, to really understand the importance of having conversations about mental illness. They lead to reduction in stigma, which leads to increasing children getting the help that they need um, to be healthy, productive, th thriving uh, citizens of their communities. We're super excited uh, to be doing the work we're doing here in D.C. So please follow the D.C. Department of Behavioral Health at DBH, the word for, F-O-R, recovery on Facebook and Twitter. You can also follow me at MH Matters MD on Twitter or at Tanya A. Royster MD on Facebook. Um, and of course, please go visit our website, healthymindsdc.com. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, this was a great conversation, and, and we hope to, that you'll continue the conversation on Facebook and on the website. Great. Thank you all, and thank you all for participating in this Facebook Live.